Yvonne is a native of Worcester, born and bred. She went to Curry College, and then she went on for a master's degree at University of Phoenix. She is uh, Director of Admissions and Community Empowerment at uh, the Robert F. Kennedy Children's Action Corps, and I think she's going to tell us more about what she does if she speaks today. Uh, welcome, Yvonne Addo. Thank you for having me, um, fellow Rotarians. I have a question. Do I have to stand back here? I do. Okay, that's fine. I can do that. Um, so I, I was invited to come and speak to you all just about some of the work that we do. I, I, um, I am the Director of Admissions and Community Engagement, although I do empower the kids that I, do, I work with. Um, I have been there for about eight and a half years in uh, a, a variety of different sort of disciplines. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the agency because I do want to sort of get to the kids. Um, but I will say that there are three different phases um, of the agency. Um, so there's DCF. Um, the program that I, that I currently work at is located in Lancaster. We currently have the capacity to house 72 children. Um, we also have a school on our campus. Um, it's a residential school where we have about 30 to 35 day students who attend from the community. Uh, the majority of those kids are in foster homes, they're in other group homes, they're in shelters, and they, they you know, get bussed out to our um, Chapter 766 school. Um, our programs are all co-ed on our campus. The age range is 11 to 18. Um, we have everything from long-term to short-term um, programs. And when I say long-term, you know, several years ago, it used to be you would have a kid in a residential treatment facility for three years. Um, and, you know, that student would become so institutionalized. Now, they're with us about six to nine months, nine, mo nine months to a year, max. Um, these kids come to us for a variety of reasons, um, and often in no fault of their own. Um, a lot of the kids that we see, they have been in the system since they were infants. Um, pulled from their homes, um, from parents who have been suffering from some abuse, um, prostitution. A lot of our kids are being prostituted. Uh, a lot of our um, teenage girls, we're, we're finding more now that a lot of our uh, teenage boys as well have been prostituted by their parents um, that come to us. Um, you know, just a lot of substance abuse and alcohol abuse, a lot of sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse. This is the majority, I'll, I'll say about 90% of all of our kids come with this history. Um, as the director of admissions, I, you know, I, I get all the referral packets. I also have the opportunity to meet with each and every uh, student that is intaked into our programs. Um, and I want to say it's, it's, it's often sad when you sort of read the history. These kids who've been in, um, since they were an infant, they've been in uh, foster homes. They've been, um, they've, some of our kids have been adopted. Um, a lot of times these families rescind the adoption, which means they say, well, you know, this is not what I signed up for. This kid is just way too much work. Um, and I think what we found with um, trauma is it, it shows itself. It's sort of like an imprint in the brain, and it, and it does show itself um, earlier, you know, early on, I, I think it's maybe from 10 on, it, the, the kids start to sort of have um, a lot of behavioral issues, um, you know, social issues. And so when that happens, often these, these parents or these families who've adopted these children, they rescind and they'll drop them off at DCF, at the DCF office with all their stuff and say, we're done, it's just a lot of work and we really don't want, um, it's, too, it's, it's more than we sort of bargained for. Um, so these kids, these are the kids that sort of come to us, you know, and they have a lot of trauma and a lot of, um, a lot of, of issues of their own. But I will say, when I go to interview these kids, um, as we know, children are extremely resilient. Um, and I don't know that I could be as um, optimistic and hopeful if I sort of walked in their shoes and at such a young age really saw and endured some of the things that they've been through. Um, but they are. They're, um, I interviewed a young, a young man uh, a couple days ago who was locked up um, at a DYS facility and he got into some trouble uh, for the first time. Um, as soon as he got pulled from his home, his mother left and she went to Haiti um, and she's been there for three years. He's had no contact with her. 
he was in the secure treatment for about a year, um, and his father also washed his hands of him. So this youth has no one, um, and you know he's been in DYS. It's a bit different; they're not therapeutic at all, unlike um, a lot of the uh, sort of DCF treatment programs where it's, it's really therapeutic. Our, our potent uh, our kids in our programs, they have individual therapy once a week, they have family therapy, there's a lot of um, adventure-based um, programming that happens as well. Um, and, you know, they have tutors, they have teachers. Um, when they have behaviors, they're not isolated. When these kids are in detention facilities, like this young man I interviewed the other day, they're isolated completely. They're, um, they can't talk to anyone, any other students, they can't talk to their clinician, they can't talk to other staff members. Um, and then when they're given their schoolwork to do, they're given their schoolwork in a hallway in a little small chair, they're given a packet to sort of work on independently. Um, and if you know anything about the kids that, that come to um, an agency like, like RFK, our kids have been pulled from homes multiple times, pulled from DCF placements, um, you know, foster homes. Um, they have what they call um, night to night. So a lot of our kids, prior to coming to us, they um, are sleeping at different foster homes every single night. So every morning they get up, their DCF worker comes and gets them, they pack up all their clothes in their bag. Often it's a trash bag or a milk cart or a box. So they pack up all their bags and then um, they, they're expected to go to school and be you know, fully involved and invested and participate in their learning. Just, it's difficult to do when you don't know you're sleeping from night to night. Um, and, that, and that happens um, on a consistent basis for weeks, sometimes months, before they can find um, the youth a placement. And what we see at, um, at RFK is the older the kids get, um, I suppose in the eyes of some folks, the less desirable, the less cute they are. And, and um, so the chances of them being adopted or being placed in a foster home long term so that they can thrive and um, have some stability and go to school without sort of these multiple placements that require them to also change schools, make new friends. Um, it's a lot of transitions for a young person. And so the work that we do um, at my campus, you know, there's a school there. So the, primarily we have, the kids can stay up into their 19th birthday, which is a really great, um, it's a great option for them. So a lot of our, our kids will opt to stay, they'll sign themselves in to DCF, and they'll opt to stay with us so that they can get a high school diploma. Because the chances of them um, completing high school when they leave um, our facility or many, many of these other um, treatment facilities are really slim to none. Um, so that's sort of like our DCF um, component. Uh, we, we also have um, contracts through the Department of Youth Services, and so we have um, a program in Westboro, which is the only secure treatment program for girls in the Commonwealth. Um, and we also have one in Westboro for our males. And um, although it is a secure treatment and um, DYS is pretty strict and, and very rigid in terms of what the kids cannot do, for instance, they can only have visits once a week. When their family members come, if their family members come, or uh, visiting resources, um, they're thoroughly searched in a way that they would be searched if they walked into a penitentiary. Um, if they bring food, they're going through the food, they're going through everything, it's very invasive. And the, the students are also strip searched um, before and after every visit. And these are young people, these are ages 13 to 18. Um, and, and if they're lucky, 18, you know, if they're considered a youthful offender, um, whereas they don't have to go into um, the prison system with the adults at the age of 17. So um, our, our programs work really well in terms of working with the family um, and, you know, trying to keep the kids connected to whoever they have in the community. Doesn't, and it's not often a family member. It, it could be a teacher. It could be some visiting resource, some mentor, um, a neighbor. Whoever that, that adult is in their life who um, is a positive influence. Um, the other thing we do too, we have a couple of uh, diversion programs, um, DDAP. Uh, we have a DDAP program out in Hamden County, and we have one in Boston. And what that is, is we work with um, the school systems, uh, ideally the superintendents of the different um, counties, um, judges, probation, um, I think that's it. Um, and we try and get everyone together on, the, uh, you know, to get everyone on the same page so that when the kids are going before the judge, if, if they're going through, if they're already in the system and they have to go before the judge, um, for instance, it was a, a case m most recently where we had a young, um, uh, a young man, he was 16, young boy, he was 16 years old and his parents, um, 
he was with us and uh, he went to school and got on Facebook and found out that his parents, um, his mother was arrested, he hadn't heard from her. Um, he couldn't reach her by phone in quite some time. Uh, went on Facebook and found out that she was arrested uh, for prostitution and the father was also arrested. Um, and so if you could just imagine being a young person, 16 in a program, he has two small siblings, eight and six years old, who were in that home, doesn't know where they are, um, and often our kids' siblings are separated when they're in foster homes, they don't keep them together because if they can, they will, but they often can't. Um, so you might have one kid in New Bedford, you might have another kid in Boston, um, so it, it's a lot of stress um, on our young folks. Um, and so with that said, um, one, of the, one of the initiatives that um, I've started out on our campus in Lancaster is a mentoring initiative. Um, getting folks from the community um, to take on mentoring a student. Um, and that could be once a month. I mean, some of our kids, uh, they, they have nowhere to go during the holidays, weekends. Um, they're sort of, you know, they're at the program. We do a lot of activities with them and, you know, uh, keep them involved and busy. But um, it's always great when we have someone who's, who's interested in sort of taking a young person under their wings and mentoring them. Um, we have a lot of tutoring opportunities as well. Um, we have a lot of kids who are just into, um, you know, they have different re religious affiliations. Um, and they're just sort of looking for some guidance um, and some mentors, preferably some adult um, older mentors. So um, I, I do have to actually leave early because I have to be in Taunton for 2.30 today. Um, but I will leave my card and I just sort of would, would charge you all if you're, um, if you're at all interested in sort of becoming a mentor or um, a tutoring or just sort of becoming a visiting resource or helping some of our young folks to um, you know, learn how to garden or plant. And they're just into a variety of things, um, becoming a, um, a coach another thing that um, is also available. Uh, please feel free to reach out and, um, and contact me. Um, that's it. Do we have any questions? Do we have questions? Tim? Do the kids who are prostituted as, as children ever recover? Are they ever able to lead a normal life? Um, they, the kids are so resilient, you, you, you would really never know, but there's a, it's a lifelong process um, that these kids go through. It's, it's, I, don't, I don't think they'll ever sort of be at a point where... Sorry. You need to speak into that one. To be okay. So it's a lifelong process for these kids in terms of their healing. Um, and when they come to us, you know, they're already 16, 17. Um, we have some that are even younger than that. Um, and so it, it, it certainly is a lifelong process, but we do see kids go on to, um, some of our kids have gone to college, they call back, they're in college. We have one young man who had a really, really horrific story. He actually um, was, he interned at the DA's office in the Middlesex um, County. Uh, so yes, we do have kids who are able to sort of lead really successful, normal, um, if you will, lives, you know, considering all this, but um, it's, it's, it's a process. It's a lifelong process for sure. Barbara Guthrie? Do you see uh, the need for your program increasing, decreasing, staying the same? What, what's the like out there? Yeah, I think there's always going to, going to be a need for residential treatment. I think that that higher level acute type of kids, um, because <clears throat> what we see now is the kids who come to our residential long-term uh, treatment program are the kids who used to be hospitalized in psych units, where they are chemically restrained, they are physically restrained to beds. That, is, that really is no place for, um, for anyone, uh, never mind a child. So in that sense, yes. However, um, I think whenever possible, if they can be in a normal, in a home, in a home-like environment, um, and, and leading as normal a life as possible, so, you know, foster homes that are, are uh, geared towards lifelong homes for these kids, so they're not bounced around, um, that would be ideal, uh, and more group homes that are more home-like, you know, less institutional and less rigid, and they can sort of take part in, um, you know, regular activities that their peers take part in. Lisa's hand went up first. I see you, Carl. Get you. Area or from all over the state? 
Yeah, no, most of, about 100, 99.9% .9 of all of our kids, um, they're, they're from, from the, com throughout the Commonwealth, but the majority, you know, a lot of them are from uh, the inner city, so, and, and western, um, you know, the western region, so we have a lot from Springfield, really tough areas in Springfield, and Holyoke, and, and Boston, and New Bedford, and Fall River, and, you know, those sort of concentrated areas. Um, Yes. Um, how do you select and screen your mentors, and do you put them through any type of orientation process so that they're getting the kind of messages that you want the children to get? Sure, that's a great question. Yeah, so um, all of our, our mentors or volunteers who come in there uh, really depends on um, what their interest is. So if they're interested in, in mentoring one of our youth, we want we want to make sure that um, it's going to be a good match. Um, and so there is a you would go through a training. It's an orientation training. It would take you sort of through boundaries and and, and take you through um, some of the different um, diagnoses of our kids. And um, but you would also have an opportunity to sit and meet with this kid and have several visits with them, um, supervised, you know, of course, um, until, you know, the two of you feel comfortable. Um, but there is, a, there is a training process that you would go, go through, for sure. Any more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Can you uh, leave some information with me and about how to, your program, and we'll uh, disseminate it. To Here's them. a gift for coming. So you remember us, and don't forget to give me that information.